basically the Pump House Barney and Pump House Flanders would supply water. They would pull water from channels that came from the Euphrates River, supplying Camp Fallujah and uh, the town of Fallujah as well. well with their drinking with, with water. With water, yep. And it, you know, it's not clean enough to drink, but they can boil it and, and whatnot. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's your time. You're at an outpost in the middle of nowhere, and that's, that's war. And uh, uh, Colonel Bristol, yep. uh, he was in charge of defending Camp Fallujah, and he decided that the way to do that was to stop the uh, uh, bongo attacks. What, yeah. what, what are bongo trucks? Well, it's, uh, they, would, they would weld mortar tubes uh, into the back of these bongo trucks, which are basically pickups. It would be similar to our S10 or a Ford Ranger or something like that, except the cabs are tall and, and flat. Uh, real goofy looking, they've got sides on them, and they would attack Camp Fallujah with mortars and then drive off. So by the time we figured out where it came from and wanted to return fire with artillery, uh, it was too late. You know, they were long gone. And, uh, and that, uh, they have a long distance, those mortars. So yeah, they up to seven miles. So they might have been seven miles away from your camp. So you really had to go outside the wire a long distance in order to just protect yourself. Yeah, yep. And a lot, a lot of times it was going into areas that uh, Marines and soldiers had not ventured into for two years even, you know, one to two years. And so uh, an area that insurgents and, you know, people that didn't want Iraq to be free and safe sure. were able to operate uh -huh. with, you know, no threat to them. And you had mentioned the insurgents, uh, you talk in the book that uh, they operate by fear, that that's the big yeah. difference between their warfare and the American soldier. Yeah. That they, they terrorize the civilians. They do, yeah. That, that's how they'll, you know, they'll want to move into a village and blend in with them. So when we came through, it would just seem like a member of the village and it was no harm, we would look around, everything's fine, and then go to the next village. Um, and when civilians, villagers, didn't want them to be living there, then they would oftentimes capture them in the middle of the night and take them and torture them and oftentimes behead them. Oh. And it was a way to kind of send messages saying, you're gonna cooperate with us whether you like it or not, and you're not gonna to talk to the Americans. And then uh, kind of the, the crux of the book is uh, you call it a good day gone bad. Mm -hmm. And could you describe uh, for our viewers a little bit about what happened to you that day in your yep. Humvee? Uh, it was December 2nd of 2006, so just over four years ago. Uh, we were on a patrol near Fallujah. We left Pump House Flanders at that time. We were staying there. And we had done a foot patrol in the morning to, to watch an intersection that had been you know, there had been a lot of enemy activity there. Nothing happened. So we went back to, to camp, to Pump House Flanders, uh, ate, took, rested a little bit, and then uh, our lieutenant had said that there was suspicious activity to the south that needed to be investigated. So uh, five of us went into a Humvee. Three guys went into a, a tank in front of us, a Bradley fighting vehicle. We went down to check out that. That ended up being nothing as well. So it was really shaping up to be a good day. We were just going to go back to Flanders hang out, uh, eat, and relax a little bit, work out. Uh, but when we were leaving that suspicious activity area, uh, we got a call from headquarters saying that uh, one of the unmanned drones had spotted someone putting in a roadside bomb at checkpoint 3-4, which was nearby. We were the closest, so they told us to go and take care of it. So we had it down there. The tank was to the front. We were the second vehicle. And I was sitting in the right front passenger seat. I was vehicle commander. And uh, I was running the radio, and I remember calling in checkpoint 33, saying we were almost there, letting them know that we were near the objective. And as we turned a corner uh, to go there, it was kind of the home stretch. Uh, I heard this, this metallic clank, this plink, and this loud quiet, like uh, when you do a cannonball into a swimming pool. Uh, I don't remember. So it isn't as noisy as you would think yeah, a bomb going I think up. your ears just can't register how loud it is. It, it was 200 pounds of explosives packed into propane tanks. So just under half of what brought down the Oklahoma City Government Center. And we were sitting on it. I don't remember flying through the air. I don't remember hitting the ground, but I remember slowly waking up on the ground. Uh, and I heard rocks falling. It sounded like a hailstorm. And uh, I really, I didn't want to believe what happened, but it just, it was too real to think it was a dream. I opened my eyes and I saw uh, what had been a fully armored Humvee that we had been riding in. And it was on its side and it was facing the opposite direction. 
and was kind of towering over me. And I just remember looking at it and it was just mangled. It wasn't even rectangular or anything like that, just parts sticking out of it. And uh, uh, I felt like uncomfortable, like I had fallen out of bed and I knew something was wrong. I looked down and I saw that my left leg just above the knee was uh, connected probably by my pant leg, but maybe just a piece of skin. Uh, the femur was broken and sticking out, so I saw my bone sticking out of my leg, and then my right leg just below the knee uh, was gone, basically. It was too, like I stuck it in a wood chipper, and it was uh, bleeding profusely. Um, Were you in a lot of pain? Not at that time, no, but I saw the blood, and I figured that this is how my life was going to end, and we didn't have a medic with us, and so it was the vehicle in front of us that turned around, and they came back. And they rushed over, and the first guy came up to me and, uh, you know, told me, hey, you know, your legs are in really bad shape, but you're going to be okay. We're going to get you out of here. You're going to make it. Uh, and he put a tourniquet on my right leg because that was bleeding the worst. And then he had to go work on the others. And, uh, you know, I kept wanting to close my eyes because I, I knew that I wasn't the worst one. I knew there were people more injured than me. And so I wanted to just kind of, I didn't want to see my friends hurt. And uh, I kept wanting to close my eyes. But I would kind of go into like a dream sequence. It was like, you know, when you're really tired and the minute you close your eyes, you're dreaming already. Mm -hmm. It was it was like that. And then they'd hit me. They'd say, hey, keep fighting. Stay awake. And then my other buddy, Todd, came over, Everson, and uh, put a tourniquet on my left leg and said, all right, you know, hey, we're going to we're going to everything's going to be fine. We're going to be back home soon. You know, you're going to be home with your family. Everything's going to be good. And uh, and then. They had to move me away from the vehicle. And uh, they warned me, uh, Gallant told me, he said, this is gonna suck really bad. And they flipped my left leg up onto my chest and moved me, and that's the only time I really felt pain. It was because my pelvis had been broken off of my spine. And uh, they set me to a spot where the helicopter could get to me easier, and I was away from the vehicle, because they had to move the vehicle off of one of my friends mm. uh, who was pinned underneath it. Uh, and I laid there, and. Uh, one of, the, one of the guys that had been in the vehicle came over and was trying to, to talk to me and stuff, but he had a head injury, so he kept repeating the same questions, and I was getting annoyed with him and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> so a, a little humor in all this tragedy. Yeah, I told him to shut up. <laughs> kept asking me where, what my wife's name was, what my kids' names were. I don't know. Maybe if, maybe if I didn't make it, he was going to marry my wife. I don't uh, know. <laughs> no, he's a good guy, but... Uh, the helicopter came. I, I got cold at one point, and I had been a trained EMT by this time. And, uh, you know, you learn that that's one of the last symptoms of shock. And it's cold. And it's cold. And so I told Adam, I grabbed him, I said, tell Katie I love her. And I thought that was going to be the end. And then, and then Katie, so you actually were out for eight days. Yeah, the last thing I remember and, is being on the helicopter. And yeah. then when you opened your eyes eight days later, there was Katie. Yeah. To help you. Yep. Yep, and the nurse, the nurse asked me uh, if I knew where I was. I thought I was in Germany, but she told me I was at Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. And then she said, uh, do you know who this is? And it was my wife. And uh, she said, what's her name? And I was like, oh, my God. And I couldn't remember her name. You know, I was coming out of this coma. Uh, and then I remembered it, and it was all good. But I looked down, and I saw that uh, my legs had been fully amputated. You know, I was in casts and hooked up to machines. And I kind of remembered the blast. Um, I asked Katie, I said, uh, how's Tim, how's Nellie, who was my roommate and one of my best friends. She said, he's going to be fine. He's in Iraq still. He's going to return to duty. And I said, what about uh, everybody else? And she, that's when she said that uh, Corey and Brian were killed. And when you were at Walter Reed, they'd always ask you uh, if they could do anything to help you. And you kept telling them you wanted to, to see the president. Right. Well, I, I, just, yeah, I said, yeah, I want to meet the president. I want to meet the president. And, yeah, they thought that I, they kept just kind of blowing me off because they thought that I was mad at the president because I'd been hurt, you know, in the war. And uh, I finally told them, no, I want to meet him, I respect him, and, and uh, so I got to. And then in the course of your cover, you actually met the president three times. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and in particular, when you were awarded the Purple Heart, he gave it to you personally. Yeah, that was the first time I got to meet him, and my wife and, and uh, kids were there. And uh, that was very special, and the thing that... Uh, that was most special to me it wasn't that he pinned it on me and was nice to me and stuff like that which he was uh, but he squatted down to my kids level and looked at him face to face and explained to him what the medal meant and uh, he said uh, do you do you guys know uh, what this means they said no and he explained it to him then he said are you proud of your dad and they said yes we are 
Uh, and he said, you should be, he's a hero. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't believe I'm a hero, but it means a lot coming from the President of the United States. And uh, my boys, you know, they were little at that time, but they specifically remember that day. Sure, they'll remember that all their lives. Yeah, um, so then you, you kind of built your new life. You yeah. came back uh, to St. Paul and you had a, a hero's welcome. There was John, Sergeant John Creasel Day in St. Paul. And mm -hmm. again, the generosity of O'Gara's. Yeah, yeah, the people uh, at O'Gara's and uh, my wife's work uh, at that time was Eagle Global Logistics. Uh, just, you know, and, and all the people that I've never met that just came out to help us and show support uh, for my wife and for my kids and for me. It really made, uh, made going through this a lot easier. And uh, the Minnesota Twins had, had a day for you, and yeah. uh, you got to throw a pitch out. I got to throw the first pitch out. Uh, that was the day before the O'Gara's benefit, too, yeah. And uh, you, you think Gardenheider can use a little glove work, huh? Yeah, he kind of took a halfway swipe at it, and it was, uh, I, I joked about it when I see him now, but uh, it, it's, it was all good. Uh, well, it, I, Joe Maurer probably would have caught it, though. He probably would have, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, in, in your book, too, uh, John, you... you you talk about your heroes, your own personal heroes, the soldiers that, that passed away, uh, McDonough, Reistead, and uh, was it w Wasica? Wasica, yeah. Wasica. And uh, Corey, Corey and Brian, Brian McDonough and Corey Ristead were the ones that were in my vehicle. Uh, Jimmy Wasica died a month later in a separate attack. But uh, those guys were very close to me, especially Jimmy. Uh, we. I don't remember being in the military without Jimmy being there with me. But So he, he joined uh, the same route you did with yeah. the National Guard? And yep. And so it's, uh, we made it up through the ranks together. And, um, you know, those guys really uh, have made me look at life a lot different. And, and uh, you know, I don't, that's why I don't feel sorry for myself. I lived through a blast that killed two of my best friends. And so it would uh, be awfully selfish for me to feel sorry for myself and uh, yeah. kind of sulk and quit. So in your quest as a motivational speaker, uh, your philosophy that, uh that all your wounds have healed ex except a hole in your heart, and, yeah. and that's okay. It is okay because uh, if, it, if it didn't hurt, there'd be something wrong. I mean, I love those guys. I still love them, um, and I miss them every day. I wear, um, wear their name on my bracelet. They're with me all the time, and uh, it's one of those things that, um, you know, they, they give me perspective and um, make me appreciate the things. Even those days that sometimes I wake up and I'm like, man, my back is sore today or something. Um, I'm going to be okay. Sure. And uh, Jim, uh, we, we, we would be remiss if we didn't <laughs> tell our viewers where we could uh, get that book at, where they can purchase the book. Because right. you, you've been on kind of a book signing tour here. We have. Well, it's available at all the major bookstores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Borders, and we've got uh, been, been to quite a few of those stores. And, and, or you can also just go to our website and, and see more about John. It's stillstandingstory.com. Okay. And the book's available through that as well. Well, you know, uh, I want to thank you both for coming down here today uh, to Channel 6 and sharing your story with us. And I want to thank the viewers for watching Mirror on the Metro. And I re really recommend getting your book, John. So thanks so much for coming thank down. Thank you. Jim, really appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you.